Welcome to the RCBC, Rowan College of Burlington County. You're after we'll refer, refer to it by our acronym, RCBC, Global Studies Lecture Series. This is a continuation of a series of conversations that started in fall 2020 in global health environment and security and key international issues affecting those. This series is sponsored by, partially sponsored by the U.S. Department of Education's USFL, that's U-I-S-F-L, Undergraduate International Studies and Foreign Language Grant Program, uh, which has uh, graciously given uh, RCBC and our partner institution, Rowan University, a multi-year grant to build global and international studies designations and programs, uh, and also courses in high demand languages such as Arabic and Chinese, along with student activities reflecting these initiatives, including uh, the Global Studies Lecture Series that you're a part of this afternoon. Uh, this series is also hosted by RCBC, Rowan College of Burlington County, a mid-sized community college in Mount Laurel, New Jersey, serving the geographically largest county in the state with anywhere from 7,000 to 10,000 students each semester. Our college is one of the most ethnically diverse student bodies in the state and region with one of the lowest tuition costs as well. We offer a diverse array of degree and certificate programs across numerous academic and workforce focused disciplines, including our forthcoming global studies degree designation. Many students stay for a third year in our innovative three plus one programs, whereby students can earn a four year degree at high, highly reduced cost. And this is an appropriate uh, host institution as well for such a series as this on international issues, as RCBC has one of the most diverse student bodies uh, based on major demographic characteristics, such as ethnic background and country of origins of students. I'm your host for this series uh, and this event. Uh, my name is Brandon Chapman. I'm a instructor and program coordinator of sociology and anthropology uh, at the college, and I'm also the project director for uh, the, the previously mentioned grant uh, at RCBC as well. Uh, the goal of this lecture series is to bring uh, to Rowan College campus, and now in the pandemic coronavirus times, our virtual WebEx campus, topical scholars, academics, researchers, and industry professionals at all levels of career, early, mid, and late career, that are experienced knowledgeable experts in global health, environment, and international security issues. And to develop this knowledge uh, with interaction with such scholars, uh, this knowledge and skill in our students at both Rowan University and RCBC. And to have a dynamic conversation about these problems and issues within these areas and to give our students such avenues to advance their training in these areas as well. Look for more of these events in the future. Uh, we have uh, we have a fair amount of leftover funds from this year. Actually, we don't have any, uh, as of right now, speakers lined up for this summer. Uh, we, were, we were originally looking to run this only in fall and spring semesters, but because we have some leftover uh, uh, money, we may be able to run a speaker or two this coming summer, so look out for advertisements regarding that. But we do have two confirmed uh, uh, speakers as of now for fall of 21 already in September, just a little preview. Uh, we will have Dr. Frank Incropera, uh, Department of Aerospace and Mechanical Engineering, University of Notre Dame. He is going to be, he's written one of the, um, one of the most influential books in the recent uh, decades on climate change and global warming and energy uh, solutions and clean energy solutions surrounding those. He's going to be walking us through some of the data on climate change, some of those policy uh, debates and issues, and talk about possible solutions uh, to that uh, international issue as well. And then in October, uh, we have uh, Dr. Stephen Kotkin, uh, Princeton University History Department, also affiliated with the uh, uh, Hoover Institution of Stanford University. He's going. He's a uh, expert on uh, Russia history, Eurasia, also sort of mega trends in uh, global uh, politics and global economy. He's going to be walking through, uh, help us walk through some of those large uh, international trends in politics, economy, and security uh, in October. So we look forward to those events in the future this eve, uh, this afternoon, I should say. Uh, we have the pleasure of welcoming uh, Dr. Jacob Shapiro, a professor of politics and international affairs at Princeton University, just up the road from us. Uh, he is uh, he holds this uh, designation at Princeton and also directs uh, the Empirical Studies of Conflict Project, a multi-university consortium that compiles and analyzes uh, data on politically motivated violence in countries around the world. Uh, his research covers a broad range of interests, uh, including uh, global conflict, economic development, terrorism, misinformation, disinformation, and uh, global security policy. He's author of a variety of works, including The Terrorist Dilemma, Managing Violent Covert Organizations, and co-author of Small Wars, Big Data, The Information Revolution in Modern Conflict. These are some of these topics he's going to be focusing on in his talk here in a little bit as well. Uh, his research has been published in a broad range of academic and policy journals, edited volumes, 
and he's conducted field research in many parts of the world and large-scale policy evaluations in places such, such as Afghanistan, Colombia, India, and Pakistan. Uh, he's been recognized by the International Studies Association as uh, a uh, top scholar uh, under 40 uh, within the uh, recent years, uh, and he is also a veteran of the United States Navy. So uh, we uh, j just sort of a note on format and agenda for the event. Uh, after this introduction, we will have Dr. Shapiro's talk. I think he may, uh, he will uh, designate this if he wants to. He may want uh, uh, interaction, possible questions and answers actually during uh, his uh, talk. Uh, so we may have that. Uh, then we will also have time uh, at the end uh, uh, to take questions in a Q&A as well. I also, as host, have a set of a few questions and uh, you know, I uh, certainly, uh, Dr. Shapiro and I, uh, have the right here with uh, depending on the volume of questions we get in the pipe to be able to choose between questions and those that are most pertinent to be able to uh, to 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 answer as well. Um, other things, just logistically here, we are recording this uh, for our YouTube channel. Uh, I do have the right to mute anybody that uh, accidentally or unintentionally gets off mute. We've, uh, especially the professionals in the room, have been in plenty of meetings where uh, unintentionally people have been on uh, unmute and have uh, interrupted things. So I do have that power as host on my end just to let you know. And I would ask too that uh, unless you are speaking, if you are speaking, uh, you can certainly put yourself on video, but otherwise uh, to have video off as to make the recording a little more efficient. So with that, uh, and with this talk titled, Organizing Online Influence Efforts, Evidence from Chinese, Russian, and Venezuelan Troll Campaigns, let's welcome Dr. Jacob Shapiro to Rowan College. Awesome. Thank you, Brandon, for that great introduction. I feel like every every year I feel older uh, and older when I get introduced. Um, so what what I want to talk about today um, is is basically the broad problem of misinformation that is executed by states to influence different populations, either their own or others, and give you some evidence from different research studies which suggests that you know maybe. Um, the problem of states doing this may not be as bad as we think, uh, but that uh, we should probably, like, there are other things we can talk about that we should be very worried about. That's the agenda. The talk is kind of written to pose questions, and so hopefully uh, folks can use the reactions button to raise hands and ask questions as I go. That'll make it more fun and interactive. I'm going to pop in and out of slides a little bit because some of these things are easier to illustrate visually. Uh, but what I really want to try and do is give you a sense for, um, well, uh, let me just show you. Uh, so the first thing I want to talk about is where this is happening. And by this, what I mean is efforts by one state to reach out and affect a population on some political issue through the use of um, various kinds of deceptive activities on social media. So this isn't necessarily propaganda. It's not traditional propaganda. And it's not even necessarily false. It's reaching out to try and, and touch another country or people in your own country through social media to move them in ways that mask the origin of the effort. And uh, this is a thing that has been happening in increasing uh, numbers of places around the world uh, since really 2011, 2012, when Russia started to experiment with it uh, in different countries. Uh, so this is from a report that uh, my colleagues Diego Martin uh, and Julia Ilhard and I published last year where we just documented uh, all the cases around the world uh, where one country had reached out to try to touch another country and influence their politics in this manner. Um, so through 2019, we'd identified 76 ones where one country tried to reach out and touch another, like, for example, uh, the Russian and Chinese efforts to support President Trump in the 2020 election here. Um, as well as 20 times that countries, including a number of democracies, took parts of their government and created social media influence campaigns trying to shape their own populations. So, you know, Russia and China are very well known for doing this. Uh, China has a thing called the 50 Cent Army, which is named after the, basically the amount they paid people for posts in support of government uh, ideas. Um, but many other countries have done this as well through means uh, of various kinds of means, and I'll show you a little bit more of that. Um, so where have these things happened? Uh, this map shows you the number of times different countries around the world have been attacked uh, since, since 2012. So the United States is obvious, it's been in the news. Uh, the United Kingdom, there was a great deal of activity, primarily by Russia, trying to influence UK politics around Brexit. 
both advancing the idea of Brexit and then after Brexit trying to discredit the government so that it had problems in the negotiations of the exit deal with the EU. The idea most people think being to provoke uh, a hard Brexit and thereby discredit the European project. As you can see, Libya shows up there in dark blue because many regional states have set up social media campaigns targeting both the Libyan population and internationals to try and shape how they think about what's going on in Libya. So lots of countries are being targeted. Um, many countries are targeting their own population. So this map shows you all the countries to date that have targeted their own population with social media influence operations, uh, including, you'll notice, uh, democracies like Mexico, uh, Honduras, uh, and, and Ecuador. Um, and they're darker for the earlier uh, those countries started doing those things. Some of these efforts are like standard spin to discredit the opposition taken to a bit of an extreme. Um, but some of them are really creating uh, political astroturf, basically creating lots of fake identities, fake accounts, trying to create the impression that there is a large uh, body of resistance uh, to the government that, that does not, in fact, exist. Um, okay, uh, what you're looking at um, uh, now are the different approaches that countries have taken over time. And in doing this analysis, we started out trying to think about uh, basically three different approaches to these kinds of campaigns, either amplifying existing content. So there's some domestic political movement, which is pushing an idea that is of interest to the foreign power. And they're just going to like retweet them, repost them, take that content and try and make it newsworthy, things like that. Uh, some of the things that went on involved creating brand new content. So for example, I'll, I'll show you some examples of um, stuff that the Russians created to try and influence US politics in 2016. And then sometimes they try to distort uh, real facts about the world. And what you should take away from these plots is that the reaching out and touching other countries has actually been uh, going down a little bit uh, since the peak in 2018, but almost always includes all of these different elements. The number of countries that are using this technology on their own populations, though, uh, is steadily growing. Now, there's another thing which you should observe from that, which is uh, if we go back a couple of slides, Almost all the like reaching out and touching other countries uh, is being done by Iran, uh, Russia, China, and Venezuela. That other category is basically China and Venezuela. So really only four countries that are aggressively using this as a tool of foreign policy. Um, roughly 20 countries that have, the, have proven willing to do it against their own populations. And if you think about what's actually involved here, it's like online marketing, it's nothing fancy. And the capability for that exists in every country around the world. So however messy we think the international information environment is right now, it is far less messy than it could be if this became a widely adopted tool of statecraft. Okay. Um, so let me pause there and uh, real quick uh, see if we, have, um, uh, if we have any questions, and then I'll go into the next part of the talk. I actually ask a question if there's not at the moment. Uh, so I, and maybe you'll explain this uh, as we go along. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the it's it's interesting to see it's interesting to see when there are patterns are interesting to see when there's no patterns too. And so this I, you know democracy is also involved with this as well. Uh, Mexico uh, a part of this uh, sort of effort in some ways too. Uh, are we going to see any distinctions between the types of uh, propaganda, the, the types of misinformation that are used between democracies and autocracies, or maybe that's something you will actually get to, but that's maybe an initial question that would be, uh, and then I think we have another one maybe on the chat board here that just came up, but that's, that's, that's an initial question, I suppose. Yeah, so I think, I think um, there's a really interesting thing there, which is, and this is a, a thing about academic disciplines, and then we'll take James's question and, and I'll answer um, uh, I'll, I'll answer um, the questions from uh, Gene and Riley. Um, almost all of the research on this has focused on Russian activities. There's a little bit on China, mostly informal, a little bit on Venezuela, mostly journalistic, almost nothing on what's been done by UAE, Saudi Arabia. The stuff that has looked at what the Mexican government has done was really focused on their attacks on journalists and in a very different um, uh, kind of epistemological tradition than what's been done on others. 
And so there are just very few studies that try to look across multiple influence campaigns and see how they work. Um, part of that for some time was a lack of data, but in the last two years, uh, Twitter in particular um, has done a tremendous job of releasing information on the campaigns that they attribute to different countries. And while their attribution isn't perfect, there's a great deal that could be done to characterize like, hey, here's how these folks organize and manage. And here are the topics they talk about. Here's how these people do it. And a lot of that work uh, just hasn't been done. Um, there are kind of two challenges there. One is it's not clear how much return there is for academics in doing the kind of purely descriptive work. And all the incentive on the NGO side is to discover the latest thing. So no one's really looking back and saying, hey, how has this worked? The other thing is no one is really collecting a sample of like what normal looks like. So in our work, we've collaborated with a, a group at NYU that's the only group that's done this. But there's no like group of academics that just said, hey, like, let's just like collect continuously a sample of what normal Americans talk about. So when we want to go study one of these foreign influence campaigns, we can say, hey, here's what they're talking about. And that's different from normal people. And I'll, I'll show you a little bit about how that's useful as we go on. But that's like a big research gap. Um, James, uh, sorry, that cross-country comparison, Brandon, is a, is a big research gap. Uh, James, you had a question. Thank you, Dr. Shapiro. So how do you differentiate between uh, a country with online influence uh, to, let's say, destabilize Brexit or to simply like lower teenage smoking, some other positive message? Totally. So, so the distinction that we draw is whether you are obfuscating the source of the effort. So if there's an online influence campaign that says, and we only coded up the political ones, but if there's a political one that, um, you know, it's like RT propaganda about politics in Mozambique, we don't code that as, as the kind of covert influence effort because everyone knows RT is a tool of the Russian state. Um, on the other hand, if they create a set of fake social media accounts that look like people from Mozambique, and have them spout Russian government talking points that we consider an influence operation. So it's about that honesty um, regarding the source of the information. That's the distinction that we're drawing. Um, uh, so then um, there were two questions in the chat, which I just want to speak to quickly. Um, Gene asked, would the rise of the Arab Spring be an example of a nation going against itself? When we coded the domestic influence operations, we made a distinction that said it has to be either an official agency of the government doing it or uh, part of the ruling party in a country that is not um, above a certain score on the polity index of democratization. So when the Republican uh, Party in the United States in 2020 hires Instagram influencers, we don't count that as state sponsored because the Republican Party has like separate budget and control from the national government here. Um, in some other countries that are not um, high on the democracy scale, we do count the ruling party as effectively being part of the government. Um, but citizens doing this, we, we don't count. Um, uh, Riley asks a good question about um, instances of the US doing this with other countries. Um, not since 2007. So there was some evidence in 2007 that a PR company, I believe it was the Lincoln Group, uh, had a contract with the US government to try and influence Iraqi sentiment uh, against ISIS and in favor of the elected government and international forces uh, during the civil war there. Um, but uh, that effort uh, appears to have been shut down when the Obama administration came in. And there don't appear to be any, um, or at least no one's uh, found similar things that the US government has done since. Uh, the U.S. government does lots of overt influence operations, like we do, we have lots of things like Voice of America and, you know, various things that support uh, opposition political movements in different countries, but they're mostly uh, quite open and not, um, not uh, trying to um, uh, dissemble about who's responsible. Um, uh, uh, Riley also asked about the Armenian genocide. Um, Turkey has certainly engaged in activity to um, uh, influence attitudes regarding the Armenian genocide. Um, uh, that's one of the few, uh, one of the themes uh, that has been in their influence campaigns 
um, not a really prominent one because most of their influence campaigns have been focused on events in Syria, uh, but it but it is there. Uh, and oh, then, sorry. Mark, oh, I was going to ask if I could comment on that. I'm sorry. Um, sure. I'm sorry. I was only going to ask just because uh, I know in my, or currently um, uh, Turkey and a lot of uh, the Turkish government is currently trying to um, like almost downplay what happened in the past and uh, with what's moving forward. And there's a lot of um, Armenian, uh, well, not, not social media influencers, but more powerful voices in Armenia or, um, that are trying to kind of tear that down in a sense, and it just sounds like it would fit well with what the topic was beforehand. Yeah, so 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 definitely, as, as with China's domestically focused efforts, some of the Turkish domestically focused efforts are trying to distract people from uncomfortable political conversations. And one of those in Turkey is the legacy of the genocide. Um, uh, but it's it's not like a huge share because, as I said, they're like they're more recent issues. They're 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 quite concerned with. Um, Miranda asks, "Is this likely to become widely used for tool for foreign policy soon?" Um, the I, I hope not. It's you know it is striking that so many states have the capacity, but so far only very few have used it. And one of the arguments my colleagues and I have made is this is like a classic place where we should think about some normative entrepreneurship, basically. Someone um, should start pushing international conventions against using this tool before it becomes more widespread. One of the most concerning recent uh, things that has been observed is France was recently caught uh, using this toolkit to try and counter Russian influence operations in a number of countries in Francophone Africa. And um, that's, not, that's not great because it's the first recent instance of uh, a, a democratic uh, country basically reaching out and trying to shape politics somewhere else through this means. It was, you know, responding to another country also doing that, but it, it set a very problematic precedent. And so I think there's reason to be worried, Miranda, but we haven't seen it yet. So far, it's, it's really been a small number of countries. Um, okay, let me, let me uh, share my screen again and We'll jump to um, we'll jump to uh, the next uh, set of uh, results. So uh, this is from this wonderful paper in Science Advances um, uh, at the end of 2020, where what they did is they basically got um, through. This is a group of uh, researchers at Microsoft Research for a huge number of Americans got to see every interaction they had linked with the internet, linked between their browsers their phones, their watches, their web TVs, like whatever. Um, they were able to link all of these things. And then on each of these, they could collect basically where they looking at news, not news, or a set of sites that were identified as fake news. And if you squint like really, really hard and get your face close to the screen, you can kind of make out the red line at the top of each of these graphs. And basically, the share of time that Americans actually spend on fake news websites is like vanishingly small compared to all the other things uh, they're watching during the day. I mean, like we can talk about the fact that like Americans 18 to 24 consume like six hours of media a day, um, which is insane and troubling in its own right. But of that, like you know, a minute or two are on fake news. So that would suggest maybe you shouldn't be too worried. Like there's not, there's just not a lot of exposure to the content. Um, something that might worry you a little bit is that disinformation consumption appears to be much higher on the right. So these are two graphs uh, from work by my colleague Andy Guess, who before the 2016 election got several thousand people to opt into allowing him to view their full browser histories. So he could see what they were looking at on their computer. And um, what these plots show is uh, basically um, uh, the share of, uh, on the left, um, uh, the share of people who visit uh, a fake news site, depending on the average partisan slant of the media they consume, and then whether that site is predominantly pro-Trump or pro-Clinton. And you could see in 2016, the people who consume a, consume 
a very conservative media diet. So like in the most conservative media diet, so people who really like only watch like Fox News and Breitbart and OAN didn't exist then, but if it did, they would have been watching it. Um, you know, uh, like 70% of them have visited a fake news site. Uh, where on the far left, um, it's around 25%. And of that 25%, the plurality was actually pro-Trump fake news. So there's like this clear partisan difference in fake news consumption. Um, and, uh, you know, so, so maybe we should be worried. And maybe this is like perverting our politics. Um, I'm going to tell you about one set of facts which should make you comfortable. So we just, my group just finished a review of uh, all 82 studies we could identify since 1995, which provided like solid evidence of a causal relationship between an influence operation of some kind and subsequent real world behavior. And across this literature, uh, there's really one clear finding which is that years long exposure to propaganda on mass media can provoke huge behavioral changes. So a complete transformation of uh, the age in which people have kids in Brazil. Massive differences in the rates at which German soldiers won medals in combat during World War II can be attributed to years of exposure to Nazi radio. And in the Rwandan genocide, differential exposure to um, the uh, the pro Hutu uh, or the kind of extremist Hutu radio stations before and during the war were strong predictors of how intense the ethnic cleansing was and the probability that Tutsi were able uh, to make it out safely and the level of inter Hutu violence. However, there are basically zero studies which show similar real world effects for online misinformation. So that would suggest like maybe we shouldn't worry too much. For evidence that maybe we should, there's this wonderful study uh, by uh, Juan Morales, an economist at um, uh, University Carlos Abrigo uh, in Spain, um, which looked at what happened at this moment in 2013 when Twitter shut down thousands of pro-Maduro bots. And so this first slide is just showing you the treatment, basically. Um, what these bots were doing is they were just retweeting Nicolas Maduro over and over and over again. And um, uh, on that date, in um, uh, late October 2013, Twitter identified this bot network and shut it down. And you can see the number of retweets for Maduro just drops off a cliff on that day. What's amazing is what's on this next slide, which is the average number of likes that tweets by opposition figures, government figures, and sports celebrities got. And you can see here that on the date of the event, when all those pro-Maduro trolls go away, all of a sudden you start to get this big increase in people engaging with opposition figures. And uh, Morales' reading of this, which I think is right, is that basically all those pro-Maduro uh, bots were jamming up the signal. Basically, people thought they couldn't get a word in edgewise. They thought everyone liked Maduro, and they weren't willing to even like take the small action of liking opposition politicians. But when that fake activity goes away, they start to express themselves more, and so you 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 have this like strong effect. So that's that's evidence that at least in the online space, maybe we should be worried that these kinds of operations can really move people. I can raise a question that they're not. Uh any at the moment, uh, we, we see the correlation between the relationship between uh, political affiliation and this, this uh, in the United States. Yes. Uh, do, do, is that the case in every or many locations? Or do we see multi-sided more, yeah, maybe that's not something you can answer, but uh, but 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 maybe you can just address that a little bit. I, I I also have a question about solutions, but maybe we can save that for the end. Maybe that's more appropriate. Yeah, I mean, I, Brandon, I wish I could give you an answer, um, but we fundamentally don't know because most of the studies have been in the in the U.S. And you know, our like for political scientists, partisanship here is like wonderfully simple because we've got like two parties, they're super well defined, uh, people are quite loyal, they have like independent media ecosystems, and 
you know, and that's that's quite strong. The closest study I, I can think of on this um, is is there some work uh, by um, uh, I'm trying to, I can't remember the author now um, on the Israeli political scene, which basically shows that when one um, particular um, very pro right uh, billionaire comes in and buys up a bunch of media properties and shifts their content far to the right. Um, the people in the places where those properties had greater circulation before he bought them than after than other places move faster to the right than other places. So it's evidence again, though, of mass media being able to have these effects, but not that social media and kind of online activity can. So again, they're, they're like we just don't have solid evidence. I think I think we have some media studies uh, that that look at you know this effect in the United States too, where Fox News, AON, other uh, entities gain more traction or more likelihood of viewership based on channel availability, that sort of thing. Yep. In certain localities, you do see farther to the right opinions or voting patterns or those sorts of things. I've, I, I, I'm sure I've seen yes. some media, recent media studies last three or four years that suggest that. That too, and, that, and, that, and that's traditional media too. We're talking about television, right? In no, a absolutely. And people have also shown that um, some of those same instruments predict like lower rates of social distancing with COVID. Um, and so, again, it's like we have very good evidence that mass media can move people, but the the online stuff we we don't have a lot of evidence on. Um, and I think, and I, and then sorry to interrupt one more time. I think you have a question on the on the message board there. If you want to look. Yep. Yeah, I was just going there from from Zach. Um, it's alarming that human interaction of social media can be effectively interrupted by AI bots. Is it a huge concern though? Uh, all that needs to be done is inform the public uh, population that this is happening. So a couple of things. One, um, most of the influence campaigns that are out there that that at least people are worried about. Are actually don't involve a lot of AI or automation. Um, you know what what we would think of as bots. They're actually mostly like someone sitting there with like fifty phones in front of them, banging away on different WhatsApp channels, or you know with with TweetDeck opened up in sixteen different accounts, and automating uh, messages across that. Um, so they're not uh, by and large automation because it turns out to be quite hard uh, to automate in ways that the platforms can't pick up. If you're trying to pretend you're a real person, like lots of them have provisions to allow bots for different things like customer service and whatnot. But to try and pretend to be like a real person engaged in politics, but automate that um, was very doable in like 2015 and 16, uh, but is, is, is much less so um, now. Um, you're right though, that informing the population seems to be effective. There's a huge body of studies on fact checking and, and a number of them look at this idea of pre-bunking, which is if I reach out and tell you before you're exposed to some lie that, hey, there's this lie circulating, um, you're less likely to believe it when you see it. Um, what has not happened yet is despite this like massive ecosystem of grassroots fact checking organizations that has emerged all around the world, uh, partly promoted, um, encouraged uh, by, by COVID, which really like gave the world a coordinated disinformation shock and uh, led to investments in fact checking all around the world. Um, people have not figured out how to deliver that information in a way that is of interest. And like the fundamental problem in figuring out cause and effect in the online space is if I observe that, um, you know, if you look at my feed and you notice that there's a lot of OAN, there's a lot of RT, and I'm super into the Q conspiracy. Um, you don't know if that's because I'm like, I sought those things out because they match my political preferences, or if, um, you know, my political preferences shifted because I got like psyched out, sucked into some uh, filter bubble. And so, um, you know, we, we, we don't have a great sense and if it is the case that what's happening is people are selecting into it, then it's very hard to get those people like the information because they're like, they're choosing it. And the, the concern a lot of people have is that um, uh, what's happening is the initial move into some of this kind of uh, fake misinformation, extreme content 
is is like voluntary. People seek it out. But once they're there, it becomes very easy to go deep and lose touch uh, with other things and other sources of information. All the evidence says very, very few people do that. When social scientists go out, go out and they take random samples, they find like very few people get sucked deep into filter bubbles. Most people actually consume a diversity of information sources. Um, but uh, it doesn't take very many people to, um, to really screw up society. So, so people are worried about that. Um, um, let's see. Uh, so, so Christopher asks, what initiatives are there currently to counter fake news? Will the internet soon be excluded from free speech? So I actually, Christopher sent off uh, this, it was editing earlier today, uh, a piece for the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists that looks at um, the results from a data collection process we did of more than 100 laws that have been passed around the world um, in the last five years to try and counter misinformation. And um, different countries are trying lots of things. Some of them, like Germany's net DZ law, um, really uh, create like a positive duty on the part of platforms to remove certain kinds of content. What that led to in the case of Germany is the platforms got very, very cautious. And so at one point, almost 10% of Facebook's worldwide content moderation headcount um, looks like it was dealing with German Facebook content because of this law. And what they did there is they just like took all kinds of stuff that was even remotely politically contentious off their platform. Now, is that like excluded from free speech or not? Like, I don't know, like you don't have free speech rights in my house and I don't have free speech rights on Facebook's territory. Right? And like, it's, it's private property. So, so, you know, my perspective is like these commons are in private hands and they can set the rules. Um, they're different than the commons we're used to thinking about that are, you know, owned by the public and therefore you know, we have different kinds of speech protections. So I suspect what you're going to see um, is increasingly um, plat the, the market is going to kind of divide into platforms that try to be safe and platforms that try to be free. And you're already seeing this a little bit, um, you know, with some of the, the more fringy platforms that seek to be bastions of, of, uh, of, of free speech. Um, you know, how you, how you think about that depends a little bit on whether you think the companies, by creating and monetizing these commons, accrue some responsibility to govern them in the public interest, or you think like it's their property and they can dispose of it the way they want to. And that, that's like a kind of deep philosophical question that as a social scientist, I'm terrible at answering. Um, um, so, uh, so Christopher raises a point, which I think is interesting that it's disconcerting as the level of dependence policymakers and political leaders, um, uh, have on the platforms. And, um, I, I think if you think the online activity has the potential to influence the real world in a significant way, then, uh, yeah, that does seem disconcerting. Um, the, the evidence isn't really clear on that. Like the evidence is clear that like, you know, certain groups that like to do awful things, uh, say awful things on the internet also like to do awful things in the real world. But how, um, how consequential having the internet is, is not clear. I'll give you two points of data that make me think maybe it's not so important. Uh, one is there's recent work by uh, a group I advise called the Network Contagion Research Institute which shows that the, one of the best predictors of where you will get um, uh, aggressive disruptions of vaccination activity and anti-vax protests are the same counties where you had counter mobilization against the Black Lives Matter movement over the summer. It is not where people are searching for anti-vax content on the web or where people are talking about it a lot. And so what that suggests is that actually like enabling that kind of collective action requires some like real world interactions. You have to actually have some face-to-face -face ties to build the trust, to, to go out and protest together. And so there's like a limit to how much can be organized online. Um, the other thing that at least makes me more comfortable about this is like, I was 
you know, um, in 2000, from you know, 2002, basically through 2017 or 18, most of my intellectual work was on terrorism and political violence. And repeatedly, we would see people saying, you know, serious policy people saying, oh, my God, look at all the horrible, visceral, incredibly engaging content these violent groups are putting up online. They're going to like that's going to like supercharge their recruiting. And this problem is going to totally metastasize. And um, it like very much it did not. Right? Um, you know, it was there was a recruiting boon um, for ISIS in 2014 and 15. Um, that turns out uh, probably not to have been tied to the awful content. It looks like it was actually tied more to the content around like brothership and making a difference with your life and like providing some meaning to, to, to things. Um, but it never took off outside this completely ungoverned space um, where lots of outsiders were funneling money in and providing training and things like that. And so it just, you know, the, the, the gap between the kinds of mobilization that people thought online content would enable and what it has actually enabled has like always been um, quite large. Um, uh, okay. Um, uh, Adam asked, do the four big countries, uh, China, Russia, Venezuela, and uh, Iran have different uh, specific strategies? Um, yes, absolutely. So, um, Russia has uh, basically centralized this in a couple of what are what are more or less like marketing shops. Uh, China has built a huge organization to do influence operations on its own population, and they've taken some of that and and pivoted them to what are mostly so far pretty low quality efforts to influence diaspora populations. Um, Iran has again a relatively low capability operation that seems to try lots of things, very few of which work. Um, and uh, Venezuela actually crowdsourced a lot of this. So um, for a while uh, in Venezuela, we don't know if this is still true, but this is pretty well reported on, um, you could download an app on your phone and get paid a piece rate for social media posts, which included uh, sets of hashtags um, and uh, keywords that were identified periodically by the government as the things they wanted to promote. And so, if you were a little short on cash in the crashed Venezuelan economy, a thing you could do is like in in um, uh, early 2017 is is push pro Trump uh, internet content. Um, so very different like ways of organizing. Um, yeah. So so Christopher um, uh, raises uh, Twitter's removal of President uh, Trump. Uh, from their platform and that potentially creating a niche market. And, you know, that's absolutely something people worry about. Um, what there are two interesting things to think about. One is if you if you concentrate the exposure to a particular set of information, in, that, in, in his case, a particular set of lies about U.S. politics, um, you have kind of two effects. One is you might create more intense exposure in the people who follow it, but it also spreads less. Like I'm blissfully now unaware of the crazy stuff that former President Trump might be saying, where when he was on Twitter, I, I saw it every day. And that, we don't know which way that trade-off plays. Um, the, the second thing, um, though, that's interesting to think about on this is, as a matter of policy evaluation, it's very hard for Twitter or Facebook or any of the platforms to understand the impact of these actions because if people are going to other platforms, that's not really something they can follow, right? The, the you know, New York Times story that says Facebook has a large team tracking Twitter activity and like scraping it in contravention of terms of service so they can understand their actions. Like no one wants that. And so within the platforms, it's very hard for them to see what's going on in their competitors. And so when we have these, these political and social phenomena that move across them, it's really hard to make sense of it, to understand what's going on. And as society, we haven't yet figured out the set of institutions that we need to help them govern these commons. So with, with some folks at the Carnegie Endowment, I've been uh, doing work on the concept of a, a multi-stakeholder research and development center, the idea of which is 
you create an independent research institution which works both for society and for the companies to answer the questions that we can't answer through the academy and that they can't answer internally. And that is exactly things like what happens when Dorsey uh, and Twitter deplatform a bunch of people. Where does the conversation go? How do the politics of people who got deplatformed move? What parts of the conversation move onto Gab versus what goes into Telegram or private conversations? We just have very little idea of that right now. And there's no one, there's no organization in our society that really has the capacity to track down on that problem uh, in the current environment. So let me, let me, let's, let's, let's pivot uh, to, to, to the last part of the presentation. So what I want to do to end is, is show you um, a couple pieces of inform, um, evidence from research papers, which suggests that this is probably a manageable problem, uh, albeit one that requires some attention. All right. So the first thing uh, I want to suggest is that the industrialized production of, of influence is, is actually like it's kind of, kind of like hard to do well. Um, so uh, what we did is we took uh, activity from about uh, 10,000 normal uh, Americans, 5,000 in a random sample and 5,000 a random sample of politically engaged Americans. And uh, from 2015 to 2018, we um, uh, built what are called topic models on top of their activity on Twitter. And this is just like taking every tweet and saying there's like, you know, 75% chance it's about, in this example, police and shootings, and a 25% chance it's about like cooking, whatever. And we basically um, took that set of topics. So that's like the, the things that normal people talk about on Twitter defined by the words in the tweet. And we projected into that model the activity by the Chinese, Russian, and Venezuelan trolls that had been identified by Twitter. So this is just Twitter data, but what it's showing you in the top two panels is the number of tweets about police and shootings by a random sample of Americans uh, in the top, by politically engaged Americans, by the Chinese trolls, uh, the Russian trolls and the Venezuelan trolls. And so you can see, and to the previous point, these are by the trolls which Twitter has identified as being sponsored by those governments. So I don't have the information to judge how well they've done that. I'm just assuming for purposes of research that they've like done an okay job of it and, and working from that. And what you can see is like, this is just like, you know, there are these terrible spikes when like, Freddie Gray dies when Alton Sterling and Philando Castile are shot, when the Vegas shooting happens, Parkland, et cetera. We're a very violent country. Um, you can see that this is a major topic for the Russian trolls through late 2017. And the Venezuelan trolls kind of come in on it in, in a bit in 2017, but then it kind of goes away as a topic. Um, just to give you more sense, this is right. Uh, another topic that the model picks out is Donald Trump and the Make America Great campaign. And you can see that there are these spikes in interest in that associated with major political events. So kind of makes sense. Um, what we can do with this is we can start to look for management artifacts in how the campaigns are executed. So what, what this plot shows you is for those five populations, again, the random Americans, the politically engaged Americans, the Chinese trolls, Russians, and Venezuelan trolls, what share of their activity is on those topics there on the upper right? So education, entertainment, faith and family, food, health, random other stuff, social media, sports, and work. And um, you'll notice that for the random and politically engaged Americans, the topic shares are pretty consistent over time. Um, the Chinese trolls show some really interesting management artifacts. And, and this one is my favorite. Um, through late 2016, a substantial share of their activity is about food. And, and just imagine some manager coming in and looking at his like weekly performance report on you know the 20 people in his social media shop, and it says like, wait, why are you all talking about food? Like Americans don't care about food. Like stop. And they stop talking about food and pick up on other topics. Uh, similarly, with the Russians, you see 
these couple moments here, they, they jump on religion, strangely, for, for a few weeks and then go away. And then in 2017, they start to say a lot of things that are about education. And they're, here they're basically talking about the U.S. university system in various ways. So there are these like very clear pieces of management intervention. Um, the other thing you, you can do with this is in each week, you can take each account and you can say, like, what's the most common topic that they've talked about? And then you can begin to look at how people flow in and out of topics. And this is really instructive because it's a way of thinking about within these organizations that are managing troll campaigns that are trying to exert influence. Someone's actually sitting there like, you know, handling the account. Are they good at behaving like a normal person and allowing their attention to wander? Or are they typically like, oh, no, I'm like the boss says I'm going to tweet about politics. So all I talk about is politics. And in that way, look very unusual and are thus findable. And so what this figure shows you is for four weeks before and four weeks after the 2016 election, the flow of conversation for individual accounts between different topics. So you can see here, there's a bunch of people who are talking about other things who the week of the 2016 election flow into talking about politics, and then they flow right out. And in the politically engaged Americans, more people always talk about politics as the most common thing they discuss. But the week of the election, a bunch of people flow in and a bunch of people flow out, like exactly what you should see. If you then go down and look at the Chinese trolls, you'll notice that in 2016, they really weren't talking about U.S. politics much. And unlike everyone else, they, they don't jump on the topic in the election week. Right? Instead, they actually, if anything, they kind of, a bunch of people leave it, see them here. But then you look at the Russian trolls and you see that the majority of their accounts only talk politics. Like, that's their thing. And a bunch of their accounts only talk about random esoteric things. They have very few accounts that are actually talking about the topics, which make up here the majority of what normal Americans talk about. So they're not so good at managing the accounts. And you can do this in lots of technical ways. And what you see is that over short time periods of like a week, they can do a pretty good job of mimicking the diversity of things normal people talk about. But as you expand out the time window, uh, they can't. They become too focused. They only talk about a few things. And if you think about the process here, you know, if I asked one of you to manage 30 social media accounts for like six months, that would get like really boring, especially if it were about a country that you didn't understand. And because you're managing 30 accounts, you don't actually have time to follow the news there and like move your attention around to like the sports thing or the political thing or the social media thing that's the hot thing to talk about at the moment. You're just like, you're on the job. And so what you end up seeing is they are weirdly consistent in what they do. Yeah, so Miranda asks, even though Russia uses online disinformation more than any country, are their success rates lower because all they do is focus on politics compared to China and Venezuela? So, um, you know, uh, Miranda, we, we fundamentally don't know about the success rates because we don't have good measures of how they're moving political sentiment. Um, you know, one thing I think about a lot is if I were a contractor working for the Russian government, selling misinformation services, or if I were the head of some bureaucracy selling information services to the government, I would be very motivated to convince them that my efforts were efficacious. And so I would produce lots of content that was designed to get headlines so I could show my bosses, hey, here's the headline. Look, the Americans are paying attention. Isn't it great? We're really influencing them. And maybe that's right. But maybe it's the same problem that we have in lots of kinds of policy areas where you're producing a thing that's hard to measure. And what happens generically in those kinds of organizations is that people sell their bosses, um, you know, kind of like low quality BS output measures of performance as opposed to outcome measures, measures of actually like moving some set of behaviors. So it's quite possible that like none of this stuff works that well. The impression that it does is very much in keeping with the incentives of two groups, the people producing it in different countries and the people who can get budget for fighting it here. And, you know, that was like a very, the, 
that that kind of threat exaggeration dynamic is very common in lots of policy areas. And in this space, we just don't know how bad that is. Um, okay, the last thing I want to show you is quickly um, that these things are, are, it's quite possible to follow them. Um, so uh, this is a schematic of, oh, this is a schematic of a diagram um, of a piece of software that we built a couple years ago. And um, all you should take away from this is we wanted to understand if I had a sample of content that was part of an influence operation at one point in time, could I use the fact that it's being produced in an industrialized way where I have to train a bunch of people who don't know some country how to produce content on that country and not just any content, but content that will move its politics in a predictable way. Um, could that fact about the production process give us the ability to track down on it? And so we built a machine learning system to do that um, that basically tried to take advantage of some things we observed in the content. Um, so this is an example of content that the Internet Research Agency, the Russian social media shop, put out on uh, both Twitter and Reddit. And you can see there's like these similarities between the two. And so sometimes the language uh, was being used. So like, you know, this Reddit account that was being run by a Russian troll was linking to content from Black Matters US, which was another um, a Twitter account uh, run by Russian trolls. So you saw this like linking between them. Um, you saw pushing on both sides of an issue. So these are two tweets in uh, summer 2016, um, basically trying to kind of push on different sides of, of the Black Lives uh, Matter debate. The picture up there is the, the building um, uh, in St. Petersburg where this thing was based. Um, uh, what did this content look like? A lot of the content was very um, uh, unique and specific. Um, so this was uh, content on the left uh, that was produced by Russian trolls in 2016. And this is content on the right that was produced by them. And, you know, there's some like, you know, thematic similarities between these. When you look at the content, though, that influence operations produce, uh, these are uh, three tweets from the Venezuelan influence operation. A thing that you'll often see is they will link uh, they will um, reply, retweet, or mention other things that are part of the same campaign. Uh, and they will link to the same domains and sometimes the same URLs within this domain. So you can see that these two both link to feed24news.com, which is a fake uh, news website set up uh, for the Venezuelan campaign. So what we can do is for each of these tweets, we can extract for every piece of content uh, two things, features that are based on the content. So this is a real tweet from the IRA campaign. On the left are features of the tweet. How many words does it have? How many words are in this, this URL right here? Uh, is it a retweet? Is it shortened? Things like that. And then we can collect a bunch of features that are about the context. So are other trolls using the same hashtag at that time? Does it reference a local news website? doesn't mention a politician or a journalist. And we can put all of those things into a machine learning algorithm. And um, basically, we can do a pretty good job uh, of following them. And um, the reason we can do that is illustrated uh, here. So this is September 2016. This is a point in time when the hashtags used by the companies were very, by the influence operations, were very good at helping us figure out is this new piece of content part of this thing we've seen before? And so this just shows you in September 2016, the top 20 hashtags used by trolls and the top 20 used by other users. And you can notice the trolls were much more likely uh, to talk about uh, MAGA, TCOT, uh, which I can't remember, um, but they didn't talk a lot about the presidential debates at the time. Um, in November 2016, Hashtags no longer really help distinguish Russian trolls from other activity. Other features of the language did. And the reason that you can see is that these areas where the Russian trolls uh, hashtag use spiked up look much more like that of normal users. They both had used the hashtag Trump about the same amount. 
TCOT a little more here, but not as dramatic as before. MAGA trolls a little more, but again, not as dramatic as before. The things which let you find new examples of their activity from prior examples of their activity change. There's not like one feature. But at every point in time, something set them apart. They made some mistake that let us distinguish in content we'd never seen before, whether that was an organic user or one of the trolls. And so what you should take away from the fact that the machine learning worked pretty well without spending a lot of time trying to make it, make it great um, was that their activity is always weird in some discernible way. So you have kind of two facts that are important for putting the problem in perspective. One, they're not that good at following the topics of the day. And two, if you can find them at time one, machine learning can do a really good job of helping you find them at time two. And so that means that if the platforms or governments wanted to really try and follow this activity, they could, and they could therefore make it expensive for people to do it. And so hopefully those two facts make us like maybe a little bit less concerned about this. Um, so that's it for slides. Would love to take other questions and hopefully that's like a relatively positive note to, uh, to stop talking on. Wanted to say this, there have been both positive and negative notes as you've uh, mentioned before, Dr. Shapiro, and uh, you, you do certainly suggest here that it is uh, because of the trends that you've identified, uh, it is quite possible to be able to effectively identify what, you know, which which is which, which is a real person, which is a bot, which Twitter certainly seems to have, at least from the news items I read, they are just news items, but uh, seems to have effectively done by with, with the with the ridding of various bots over the years, that sort of thing. So, uh, so so it is a it it, it is a potential uh, item of good news, as as I think you readily identified. I think we had a question here from uh, um, uh, uh, Zach here. Uh, if you if you want to maybe look at that. Or... Yeah, so, so Zach said, uh, I'm enjoying your presentation very much. Thank you. I get 90% of my information from Reddit. How subject is Reddit to misinformation? So, um, you know, Zach, Reddit seems to have done a pretty good job of um, sweeping out the coordinated misinformation campaigns. Um, they turn out to be kind of hard to execute on Reddit because of the voting system. Um, that said, um, there's all kinds of BS on Reddit. Um, it just doesn't seem to be, at least from what, what I know, the coordinated like nation state led stuff. It's more the organic, a bunch of people believe some crazy stuff and so they talk about it with each other and upvote it. And so it like rises to the top in, in Reddit system. Um, uh, Gene asks, I've heard that TikTok is controlled by China. Is this misinformation? If not, is this something to be concerned about? Um, so, uh, Gene, uh, I don't allow TikTok in my house. My kids can't have it. I don't have it. My wife doesn't have it. Um, because I think there's good reason to think it started out at least as an intelligence collection operation by the Chinese government. It's now, um, partly owned, uh, by the United States, how much control the Chinese government has over engineering decisions. Like who knows? Um, but the history, uh, of the US government working with technology companies to build back doors into various products that are sold around the world um, should make us really nervous, right? For like in, you know, it's, it's, if you read the histories of the NSA, one of the ways that the United States was able to get such good signals intelligence over many years is like bought their way into being on cell phone switches, internet switches, undersea cables and things like that. And it would be shocking if China weren't trying to run the same play, right? That seems like something, something lots of governments would do. Um, but, you know, in general, um, I think, you know, we're not like, we're not that far away from a, a world in which, um, you know, like everyone on this call already exists with tons of data in the databases of multiple US based corporations and surely of the intelligence services of China and Russia. Like 300 some million people is not that many people to enumerate and track. Um, uh, okay, so uh, Christopher asks, um, 
Uh, should the American government try to solve this with DOD budget dollars, infrastructure dollars, or both? Um, you know, I think that's an interesting, there's an interesting trade-off in trying to solve this with the government, which is a lot of the activity that we worry about is happening on commons, which are owned by private companies, the majority of whose customers are not in America. And so, and who aren't super, um, uh, for lots of good historical reasons, don't believe that the U.S. Department of Defense has their best interests at heart. And so if the U.S. government, particularly through DOD, tries to push a lot of regulation and management in this space, that potentially makes it very hard for the companies to cooperate in that management because it becomes a marketing risk overseas. And so I tend to think the solution is going to have to rely lie in some set of legislation, which makes it easier to create independent, uh, non-governmental, non-company uh, organizations that track this space um, and allow them to work on it. Um, what makes that hard is it's like, you know, what's appropriate and not is very culturally specific. And so you run into this trade-off between advancing a particular view of freedom and free speech and what's appropriate discussion that we might like with our the also the value of like not imposing our values on others and so you very quickly get into like very tricky boundaries um so apologies for for the dodge but um i i don't i don't know what the the right answer uh is there um uh christopher uh raises the point um that people will always be biased to believe news that is in line with their worldviews fake news or not this problem is not going away um Yes, that's very true. Um, uh, there are differences in how that bias plays out um, between like different political persuasions and personality types and whatnot. But yeah, it's very much a, a, an issue. I think the question is whether that we should be concerned with is whether these kinds of new commons that we have are making that problem worse or not. And, um, you know, the my work in the space is motivated by the kind of precautionary principle that says, um, I think probably not, but there's a small chance they could make it way worse, in which case we should work on it and understand it. Um, uh, Leanne um, asks, I've watched the Pandemic Doctors interview documentary, and they mentioned how much misinformation impacted the process of understanding the symptoms and how the COVID virus actually spreads. Do you know if bots were involved in this process? Was it impactful? So this is, I think, the COVID-19 misinformation and medical misinformation generally is a fascinating space because some unknown share of the misinformation on uh, COVID vaccines and medical issues generally is, uh, is for-profit grift. It's people trying to um, tell a story that folks like to hear about, like natural wellness or you don't need doctors, and drive them to sites where they can sell them merchandise, they can sell them ads, they can sell them supplements, um, or they can draw a lot of eyeballs to the site and then sell the ads in the, the online ecosystem and, and ad ecosystem. And I think the way I think to think about this is, um, you know, the ad tech community has created this amazing machine uh, for monetizing creative activity. A group of people have figured out that they can take advantage of that to make money off um, selling basically bullshit in the like technical academic sense of the term of like content that has no concern with truth or not um, as distinct from lies um, by selling bullshit on health. And we don't know in the health misinformation space how much of the conversation that's creating the problems uh, which Leanne identified is people who really believe and are authentically sharing their concerns versus people trying to make a buck. And so um, I have a new project I'm working on with a couple of folks to try and get at that. But I think that's a huge problem in this space. And that's also true for political misinformation. You know, we don't know how much of the really awful content, say, related to um, the QAnon conspiracy uh, is about people who really believe that's going on and are trying to honestly share it versus people trying to drive traffic to sites where they're selling Q merch. Um, and until we understand that, it's gonna be very hard 
to like nail down the right policy approach because if it's authentic expression it lives in a space in the united states that's protected by the first amendment if it's on public grounds we're still not sure if it's like on this private infrastructure but kind of seems first amendment protected whereas if it's for-profit activity we have all kinds of rules that regulate commercial speech and all kinds of agencies that exist to regulate commercial speech that could be plussed up to address the problem. And so I think one of the big research priorities here has to be understanding how much of this is authentic versus uh, for-profit activity that's trying to grab uh, people's attention and interest in alternative ways of looking at the world and turn that into money with the pernicious effect of creating this strata upon which all kinds of crazy health stuff and political stuff can go on. As, as we get towards uh, perhaps the end of this uh, of this event or uh, maybe towards the last part of our questions, it's we with the series we've always tried to and I think effectively do uh, get towards solutions or talk about solutions uh, substantively, especially near the end in our uh, more uh, thorough Q and A session. And the point uh, in the question and in your answer, Dr. Shapiro, about the uh, the regulation of commercial sp uh, speech, and if it's possible for uh, uh, you and your team to be able to track track effectively on the QAnon and QAnon themes, uh, uh, misinformation, the coronavirus and health uh, related misinformation, and how people link to commercialized or non-commercialized sites uh, from those and otherwise would be a very uh, policy, potentially policy effective project. So it's really, uh, it's really pertinent to the sort of policy solutions that we want our students to think about in global studies and with a problem like this. So. Uh, if we are, it looks like we may be at the end of our questions. I wanted to, uh, before we go, I wanted to commend you, Dr. Shapiro, and the audience on a couple points. We've had events uh, in, in this series before, and uh, oftentimes we will have a talk and then we'll have a discussion and Q&A afterwards, uh, which is obviously fine, of course. What, uh, and I especially want to commend you, Dr. Shapiro, you did an elegant and superb job of making this intentionally interactive with our students. And I wanted to say thank you uh, proactively for that. It really was uh, an excellent way of sort of presenting this information and you know letting letting everybody in the session uh, ask questions and uh, to our audience too, thank you for really specific, really pertinent and relevant uh, questions uh, throughout. Uh, the thought that was really that was really uh, really relevant and really good. And again, not only got an understanding I think of uh, of these issues, but also potential solutions for us to think about going forward in them. One other thing too, uh, wanted to say too that um, uh, you, 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 the, the, the data, you know, you, you spoke rightly to the data, but also you sort of intentionally, I think, did this too. Uh, you got us to think from both sides of the issue. Is this a big deal or is it not? And there are, there is evidence to suggest uh, sort of both ways, right? There is the, if I, you know, may take the liberty to do a little summary here, there is evidence, well, you know, this stuff can be somewhat easily tracked and they don't always know the country that they're pushing misinformation on. And you know there are these patterns we can find, but then you know how much are people actually believing it or not, and how much real world behavior does it change? Which is still something, if I can understand your results correctly uh, and your interpretation of others' results correctly, seems like we're still trying to figure out in some ways. And so it's so you, you, I think we did a really effective job here of looking at both sides of these issues. It is certainly a big deal in some ways, but maybe in some ways it's not a big deal in these other specific ways. So, so I just wanted to commend uh, that as well. It was, it was, it was a w wonderful way of looking at this from, from both sides. And we want to try to expand our uh, students' uh, you know, abilities to be able to critically think in that way. And, and this was an especially good talk on that. So I wanted to say thank you for that as well. Yeah, no, th thank you, Brandon, for, for having me. It was awesome speaking with you all. This was, was great fun. It's great to see how you're thinking about this. I hope it was useful. And just thanks for the opportunity to share and, and to talk. This was great. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Shapiro, uh, from all of us at uh, Rowan College of Burlington County. And thank you, uh, everyone, for attending uh, today. We will be back uh, possibly this summer, certainly at latest by September for our next uh, event in the RCBC Global Studies Lecture Series, and we will see you all next time. So thank you, everybody.